Okay, welcome, 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 everybody. <laughs> welcome. Welcome to the third annual Vermont Journalism Conference. Yeah. It's an absolutely beautiful day in Vermont. We're so glad that you're going to be here. And my name is Richard Watts. I'm the coordinator of the community news service here at UVM. I'm a faculty member in the College of Arts and Sciences and the director of this new National Center for Community News that we just announced this week. But our focus today, yes, yay, it's big news, but today is gonna to be about Vermont completely. And it's so great that all of you folks are here, the people who actually bring us trusted, authentic sources of local news, local news that we need more than ever. So thank you all for coming here. And I also wanna give a special shout out to the folks who have been the vision behind this conference for quite a while, even before the last three years that we've been involved with it. Kate Robinson, Bill Schubert, Fran Stoddard, and Cree Lintelak. Just the... We have an amazing program today. You saw it in it. There's kind of two objectives. One is to bring the latest information about what's happening in the philanthropic side, philanthropy, about investing in local news. And this moment in time when everybody is starting to realize how important local news is and the connections between all these other things happening in society, polarization, trust in institutions, but just basically knowing what's happening at your community level and how important this is at this moment in time and forever. So we're gonna hear about some of the game-changing national investments that are happening. Dale from Press Forward has flown here from Miami late last night to tell us a little bit about what's happening. And we're gonna hear from the Vermont Community Foundation about a whole Vermont initiative. All of this is around this idea of what can we do to sustain and help our local media e ecosystem thrive. The second part of what we hope to do today is just get people together. Because uh, one of the great things we have in Vermont is we mostly all know each other, but we don't always have a chance to come together in places like this. So it's a chance to see old friends and meet some new friends. And lots of time built in for for networking and conversations. And towards the end of the day, we're gonna have a panel of some of Vermont's journalism leaders to talk about what they're thinking about and where they see the future going. But just in that spirit of getting to know each other, let's just take five minutes. We don't have enough time to do this for the whole room because we've grown, but let's just take five minutes and at each table, just make sure and say hello to your friends and neighbors. Okay. <laughs> Lots more time to keep, hopefully, to keep connecting with the people around you. Um, I think one thing we're particularly good at in Vermont is collaborating across the state. We're so small, we know each other, so let's just keep doing that every way possible. Um, we do, we did put out the list of everybody here and that will be on our website after this, so maybe there's other connections you want to follow up with. Um, we, uh, by the way, if you're trying to get on the Wi-Fi here, it's pretty straightforward, right? Just click on the, okay, well, I'll let somebody else explain that. <laughs> uh, restrooms are down the hallway. Uh, to in that direction, 
And okay, now I'm going to introduce uh, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, who's actually going to give the official welcome. But I just, before I do that, I want to say you've all sensed increased energy and enthusiasm, I hope, coming out of the University of Vermont directed at supporting the essential work that you do every day on helping our media ecosystem survive and thrive. A lot of us have been involved with that. It starts with leadership, and we have been so lucky to have a leader who really stands behind our work. And I will give you one concrete example. The College of Arts and Sciences has created a full-time position. This is a big deal at a university. A full-time position, not grant-funded, a full-time position to be the editor of our community news service. And so that person plays a role in editing our students' work, making it more publishable, we hope, for all of you. And that person is Justin Trombley. I just want to make sure he's... he's <laughs> so that's... Justin works in the summer, so he's here. Uh, and then I want to just recognize the first editor of the Community News Service, the founding editor, so to speak, before she went on to fame and fortune at the Waterbury Roundabout, Lisa Scalati. <laughs> There's many other things that the College of Arts and Sciences has done in addition to creating the position that I mentioned, and we're not going to get into all of them, but one of them is creating more courses so students can do these, have these experiences in the curriculum. So when it, when, when it once was more extracurricular, we are trying to bring more of these into the curriculum, and we do that by sometimes hiring professionals, professionals in the practice, and one of them is right here, Carolyn Shapiro. <laughs> uh, so real, real things, and you're going to hear way more about what's happening here in Vermont, but just real things we're trying to do out of the College of Arts and Sciences. And now I'd like to introduce Bill Falls, the dean. Thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, special thanks to our conference organizers, uh, Richard, Meg, and Scott. Where did Scott go? There's Scott. Thank you very much for, uh, for putting this all together. Thank you to uh, your exceptional teams. Uh, on behalf of the faculty, staff, and students of the College of Arts and Sciences, I wish to welcome you and thank you uh, for allowing uh, students in the College of Arts and Sciences faculty uh, to join with you to advance our common goal of strengthening local news and civic information across Vermont. Uh, this is, as Richard alluded to, a priority for the college and indeed for the University of Vermont. For many years, the college has sought opportunities to be active in our community. Our faculty, our staff, our students have so much talent, so much talent and energy. And we see part of our educational research mission as directing this talent and energy to the community that really gives this great university life. Indeed, uh, President Garamella himself has encouraged all of us to be leaning in to our land grant mission, which you know uh, has at its core the goal of improving the lives of Vermonters. Obviously, the goal of strengthening local news and civic information uh, in Vermont uh, fits naturally uh, into this land grant mission. The Center for Community News and the Community News Service was established on the firm conviction that universities have the opportunity and indeed an obligation and responsibility to step up as institutional leaders in a moment of great consequence for our democracy. I'm proud of the work that Richard, uh, Meg, and Hannah and their team have done in this space to the great benefit of not only our community, but our UVM students. And now with the Center for Community News, the National Center for Community News, we are helping institutions across the nation to fulfill their responsibilities as well. Everyone in this room knows how critical reliable news is for civic engagement, 
voter turnout, social cohesion, and thriving communities. It's an essential component of our civic infrastructure. We believe that Vermont can be a national leader here. The collaborative power of our local news outlets combined with UVM students, expertise, and resources can help forge a sustainable future for local news. Indeed, I've long held that Vermont is an ideal testing ground for innovations such as these because we have incredible access to government and civic leaders and media that allows us to be a laboratory, to be innovative, to be nimble in these spaces. And I think the success of the Center for Community News and the Community News Service is a prime example of UVM and, U and Vermont as a laboratory. And now we're tapping into the collective momentum of the Press Forward initiative and the broader national efforts to reimagine the future of news. I hope you are as excited as we are uh, in not only the Dean's office and the College of Arts and Sciences, but uh, the Provost and President's office as well. Before closing, I'd like to uh, thank, give some thanks to uh, a few of our esteemed guests who have joined us or will join us. Uh, Dale Anglin of, of Press Forward, thank you so much for being here. Anna Brugman of yeah. Anna Brugman of Rebuild Local News, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, we are we are joined by uh, the Honorable S Senator Peter Welch. Thank you, Senator Welch, for being here. <laughs> Secretary of State Sarah Copeland Hansis, thank you for joining us today. Vermont State Senator Andrew Perlchik, thank you for being here today. Uh, Dan Smith and our friends at the Vermont Community Foundation, thank you. And of course, all of you, uh, the tireless folks uh, who make news every day in our great state, thank you for being here. It's a privilege to have you all here, and I look forward to seeing the insights that emerge from this incredible brain trust. Thank you, and, and enjoy this day. Thank you, Bill. Um, it's just such a pleasure to work in this place and with Bill. Um, we don't know what journalism's gonna look like in 15 or 20 years. It's gonna have the ethics that guide us but some of the people in this room may be the people who are the leaders 15 or 20 years from now. I'd like everybody under 30 to stand up. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> All right, no pressure, but. <laughs> We're counting on you. Um, okay, now we're gonna move on with our program. I'm gonna introduce Meg Little Riley, who has been a key part of making all this happen with me for the last four or five years. She formerly has the title of Managing Director of the Center for Community News, but does pretty much everything. A big thinker and a good friend. Meg, take it away. Thank you. Um, and now I have the honor of introducing US Senator Peter Welch to the stage with me. We're gonna have a conversation about what's going on at the national level and the state level. <laughs> Senator Welch, thank you so much for being here today. Even by, uh, normal Washington standards, there's a lot going on in the world and we are incredibly grateful for your time. So the primary reason we have you here today is because we'd love to hear more about the Deliver for Democracy Act, which you are a lead sponsor on. It is a bipartisan bill. It's, um, it, it, the, it, it seeks to both solve some of the efficiency challenges in the US Postal Service while addressing reliability of our print news media. Uh, can you tell us how it'll work and why this has been a priority for you? Yeah, I can, but for, uh, before I do, uh, let me just say, uh, you know, what you're doing is so important. Uh, it, it, what has happened in our country uh, since the internet 
uh, in some ways, but particularly for local journal journalism, has been a real catastrophe. And it's a catastrophe not because local journalists weren't able to do the job. You're doing the job. It's been a disaster because the internet, uh, Google, the big operators, have totally destroyed the business model on which local journalism depended. Uh, they take your content uh, and have basically taken away a lot of your advertising. And it's just not possible to sustain an operation uh, on fumes. And uh, you know that better than I do, uh, painfully so. But the reason for local journalism has never been more important. Uh, we see how the internet in some ways connects us, but in a lot of ways disconnects us. Everybody goes into their own zone where they're gonna get their news, and they lose that sense of connectivity uh, to the community that local journalism is so essential in providing. Uh, you know, when, when I first ran for office in Windsor County, we had community newspapers. We had the Valley News, the Eagle Times, but we had Weathersfield, we had Ludlow, uh, we had Randolph, we had every community had a local newspaper. And what I found so wonderful about them is that it was a lot of news that connected people together, like who won the high school uh, basketball game. Uh, I used to play basketball, I read that. Uh, <laughs> but the, who got married? I remember reading these articles about who had been away for 20 years and came back to a class reunion. And at the time, I kind of enjoyed reading it, what I didn't appreciate is how essential to my sense of self and place getting that information on an everyday basis was how, how important that was. So it wasn't just about politics and the great issues of the day. It was like about your neighbors. It was like being connected. It was about creating some sense of common conversational space. So my, I, also, I say all that because I absolutely believe that uh, protecting local journalism and trying to make it possible for you to survive is really essential to the well-being of our democracy. Now, on this, um, uh, on our, our Deliver for Democracy bill, it really came out of talking to uh, 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 folks at Stowe Reporter uh, and the uh, Bennington Banner. And a couple of things they were talking about is high postal cost and lousy postal service. You combine the two, and it makes it much more difficult because your revenues are down, your expenses are up, and then you deliver at higher prices, but it gets there after the news is stale. So what we did was uh, get a bipartisan bill that we put together that basically said that if the Postal Service, which had been given additional authority to increase rates, including increased rates on uh, newspapers, that they couldn't do that unless they reached a 95% uh, on-time delivery rate for newspapers. Now, a lot of the legitimacy for doing that comes from the fact that the Postal Service was originally created in significant part, you know, this is Benjamin Franklin, to deliver newspapers. There was a view at the beginning of our democracy that getting publications out on time, at minimal expense to the citizenry was really, really essential to the well-being of our democracy. So fast forward, we've got a lousy postal service, very expensive, the squeeze on local journalism. So the democracy, a deliver for democracy bill tried to do two things. One, facilitate the delivery at a fairer price or better price, but second, it really was bipartisan in the sense that I talked to a lot of my Republican colleagues who come from rural states, and when I talked to them, it was like talking to the Stowe Reporter. It was talk like talking to the Bennington Banner. The challenges they faced were identical. So the two goals I have here is to focus on the importance of local news and also to have a vehicle by which we build bipartisan support, hopefully, to improve things. Thank you. Um, what you're talking about, you're singing our tune. You're talking about social cohesion and a sense of identity, and it's it's easy to it's easy to uh, talk about the sort of eat your vegetables parts of news as the kind of information we need. But 
arts calendars and obituaries right. and the things that connect us to our neighbors, uh, which we know are also a kind of inoculation against toxic polarization. Right. And they make, they facilitate problem solving at the local level. Um, one of the things I was very interested in the way this act was announced, you really leaned into this as being an explicit attempt to address the problems facing local news. Uh, Senator Rounds focused a little bit more on um, the, the Postal Service's challenges, both worthy, worthy uh, problems to solve. But I'm wondering if this is the secret sauce for finding bipartisan enthusiasm for a uh, fix to local news. Well, that was a major impetus for me. Because, you know, what I we're really, really polarized, all right, in, in, as we all know. But when you start talking to people, um, whether it's out on the street or in the halls of Congress, and you are concrete, what's going on with your community hospitals? What's going on with your kids on social media? How's that affecting you and your neighbors? You know, uh, how are you dealing with the cost of prescription drugs? You name the issue, and you start talking to a person about that as opposed to about, um, you know, you, Trump versus Biden and the macro sort of issues. You find there's a lot of, it's a starting point for a real conversation about trying to solve the problems. And, you know, one of the realities about the internet uh, and it's a whole, what we're seeing with the internet is it's a whole new economy. And the folks at the center of the innovation in creating that economy, the Googles, the Facebooks, this has happened before when there's been a new technology or a new way of uh, doing business like the railroads uh, came in and were able, the initial Railroad barons were just able to seize the massive profits that were made when we went from uh, what we had to railroads. We're seeing that with tech. And what they're doing is finding ways where they can gobble up your advertising. And it creates an incredible amount of disruption in our society. And I think you see that in very damaging ways with the sense of community and the structures that we had to help us create community uh, in all of our, uh, all of, all, all of, uh, in, throughout the country. So uh, when I talk to my colleagues, like Senator Rounds, he's a conservative Republican, very decent guy, uh, but Senator Hoven uh, also, uh, they, when I talk to them about this, they are upset about that erosion of community. So it is a way of trying to create bipartisanship. But you know, I don't almost like the word bipartisanship because it means like we just get together as opposed to we actually really, when it comes to something like local news, have a shared value about that importance, even if we don't necessarily have a shared political perspectives. But I also do believe what you just said. The way we can communicate with one another, it's grounded in trust, okay? It's grounded in common experience. It's not because I'm able to persuade you that my point of view on taxation is better than yours. You, you, if, and when you have those community newspapers that I remember when I was first in Windsor County, would sit on my table, you know, coffee table for a week, they'd be weeklies. You know, I'd go into the store and I'd talk about who won the high school game. It was like a way to start and interact where you just suddenly had a sense of trust. And I remember we had, <laughs> you know, I was in Artland and we were having a b battle over the school budget and there's gonna be a lot of those around here <laughs> this year. But I got really upset, I lost uh, my argument and the person who uh, won, was pretty difficult and in my face, I thought. So I was upset. That afternoon, I go down and I'm picking up my son at hockey practice and who's coaching him? But the guy who just beat me up at the, <laughs> at the, town, at the town meeting. So I really think anything that we can do that creates 
sort of common experience that helps us have then some trust and just, you know, that person disagrees with me. But, you know, in a lot of ways, they're trying to do the same thing as me. And local, local news really, really matters. And that's why I say to all of you who've been doing it for so long, despite these challenges, and to the young people, uh, thank you. Thank you. It's really terrific. That's great. So you've alluded a few times to the polarizing effects of the way social media algorithms they favor conflict and extremism and things like that. This bill would help lift up print local news, right. making things easier. I'm interested in whether, are, are you also, do you have your sights on other kinds of legislation that might address the role of tech? Interestingly, this is a very timely conversation because just yesterday, California's Senate passed a, a, a potential piece of legislation that would tax uh, tech companies for their role in the, the harms they've done to local news primarily. Um, and uh, so that's just one example. There's also uh, another piece of legislation, the Community News and Small Business Support Act, which has been kind of stalled at the national level on the House side. Um, I'm interested in if it, whether you are, do you know what you'll do if that bill comes to the Senate or if you have a position on other ways to tackle this? Um, the issue is money. Your advertising has been stolen, in effect, or it's been appropriated. So Senator Klobuchar has a bill that I co-sponsor, uh, a number of us do, that would essentially uh, require the big aggregators like Google to pay to use content that comes, is generated from other news, or, news organizations. And my view, that's absolutely essential, and it's just fairness. You know, the genius of the internet and Google is it can, it can just vacuum up everything, and then it's convenient for the user. We go online, and we can go and get what it is we want. But Google didn't create the content. You know, you created the content. So Senator Klobuchar's bill really attempts to essentially say, pay for it. You want to use it, pay for it. And then have that money distributed among the content creators. So I think that's really essential. Again, that we got overwhelmed with the internet and technology. And there's a lot of good things that come from that. There's a lot of efficiencies. There's a lot of applications where it really works. But there's been a lot of disruption in destruction. Local news is an example. Small businesses that get squeezed out because they don't fit the algorithm uh, on Amazon. Uh, and again, that's another example. Small businesses are essential to the well-being of our and vitality of our local communities, small and as, as our uh, smaller publications. So they should be honored and protected, in my view. Uh, at least their revenue model uh, should be protected because the goal from my perspective is yes, the internet is good, there's a lot of things that come from it, we all use it, but on the other hand, there's a lot of destructive elements that have occurred as a result of the capacity of those big uh, platforms to essentially, through their business model, destroy yours. And that's bad uh, from a community uh, security standpoint, a community well-being standpoint. Thank you. Um, that's all good news, I think, for the people in this room that we have. Well, some I do, I admit a, I'm in. just going to say another thing. Why in the world do you do this? <laughs> this is uphill, and the reason you do it is because you care about getting that local news to the people that you see at the at the at the country store. Uh, that you see at the hockey game. That's why you do it. And because you care. I mean, you know, it, 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 I'm a politician, all right? So I annoy you, and you, you, you get on my case at times, <laughs> all right? All rightfully so, all right? But the bottom line is, you can't be in the business you're in if you just don't have some, if you don't have some deep sort of appreciation for the community that you're in. Uh, and, you know, when I just see uh, you at various places I am where there's a local event, I'm there, and you know the history, 
You know the players. You know that community. Uh, it's, it's really wonderful to see. And it's fun. You know, it, 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 so I, I'm going to encourage the younger people to stay at it. But sorry to interrupt. No, that's great. Um, I should mention, too, that I believe Senator Sanders is also a co-sponsor. He is. That's right. Thank you. Um, so, Senator Welch, you have been an elected official in Vermont since 1981, I believe. You've seen a dramatic evolution of the media landscape here. And we're going to talk a lot about the forces that we've everyone's been swimming upstream against but what are you excited about what you see going on in Vermont news and civic information? Well, what I've been excited about is that you're figuring out through collaborations how to try to stay afloat when the economic forces are stacked against you. So what you're doing is defending, what I see is you're defending in practical ways uh, through collaborations through like these internships, through finding practical ways that younger people who want to get involved can get involved, uh, that you're uh, creating this network uh, within Vermont uh, of uh, a journalistic ecosystem. And it's everything from like Vermont Public to uh, the collaboration uh, with Digger, with collaboration with Digger and the Valley News, which is my local newspaper, and I see Digger articles in there. So you're trying to figure out and adjust so that you can stay afloat and provide continuous uh, and good uh, and, uh, journalistic content to, to the people of Vermont. And you know, we're lucky here that, you know, Vermont, uh, we're small, but it, we're spread out. And having a journalistic capacity uh, that gets the news out locally, but also what's going on in the state, is really important for connectivity within the state. Uh, so I see a lot of, I have a lot of optimism on the basis of uh, the way you've decided to collaborate in order to achieve your goal. Now, I do think it's really essential that we do some things in Washington that help stop the ripoff. Uh, in terms of the stealing of uh, your business model and the revenues that are absolutely vital uh, to your survival. I think you touched on something there about how I do think that Vermont, while we are subject to all of the same economic forces that are making local news hard everywhere, there is something culturally that lends itself well to this kind of collaboration. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the greatest challenges that we see nationally in trying to think about more diverse economic models for local news is that we have to socialize the idea that we have to shift from thinking about local news as being a consumer product that you buy or you don't buy and it's subject to uh, market forces to the notion that it is a civic good. It should be a part of our civic infrastructure, whether or not you like what you see on the front page day to day. Um, it feels to me like Vermont is a couple steps down that path already. The way you're talking about this legislation, it's like no, no convincing needed. Um, and everybody in this room certainly, uh, I think, is on the same page about that. Do you think that there are things that, we, um, that give us a leg up in thinking creatively for the future in Vermont about what local news can be? Well, what you just said, I think, is at the heart of it. Is it a civic good? Now, we've always known it is a civic good. I mean, that's the whole thing about the creation of the post office, in significant part, to serve the, the public by allowing publishers to get their product to people. I mean, that literally was at the beginning of our country. I mean, the Postal Service was started before we had a country, before it was the United States of America. And it was intimately entwined in this notion of civic engagement in the importance of newspapers in the written word to inform people about the world they're in, okay? So this is not new. What we have here, I think, is a, because of the smallness of our size, and, and really, you think about Vermont and the local journalistic tradition we've had with the papers, that were strong in our communities all around the state. That's the foundation. 
and we face this incredible uh, technological shift uh, that you all are in the process of adjusting to. But I think within Vermont, there is an appreciation that we have to nurture and we have to sustain that journalism is a civic good. And it's good when it's getting the news to people. And by the way, you know, the work that Vermont journalism did uh, uh, in, in the flood was unbelievable. I mean, everybody was just riveted. No, it, and, and you know, it was, a, you, you know, and I, that obviously I would be touring around as a, a lot of us were, and you were always there, but I could see, and my wife and I were just checking everything we could all of the time, what's going on here, what's going on there. You guys did an amazing job, and it was an example of why you have to have that infrastructure in place uh, for those moments when there's just this urgent and voracious need. Thank you. Um, we agree. Before you go, we have to ask. Uh, there's, a, there's a small election coming up in a few months. There's a lot going on in the world. How do you feel about the state of our union and democracy right now? What are you thinking about for the future? <laughs> in one minute. Was there a debate last night? <laughs> I'm worried, okay? That was not good. Uh, so we'll see, but no, two things. Number one, uh, not referring to the debate, but the, what's happened in our country is that norms that we've all lived by have been shattered. And uh, you know, in January 6, I was in the building, and I was in the part of the house up in the gallery, which was actually in the most danger because we were trapped there, and uh, we couldn't get out. I was about 20 feet from where the shot was fired, and uh, I was in the gallery when the mob was breaking the uh, doors down, and I was looking at these police officers down there who I knew, and they had their guns out, and I was just terrified, thinking about the decision that uh, one of those young uh, men and women was gonna have to make about whether or not to use their gun. Um, and as I was hearing the glass break, and they were telling us to put the, uh, the hoods on, I, w I was scared, you know, obviously. But this is, when I think back, what struck me the most. Even though I was there, even though I was witnessing what was happening, I didn't believe it was happening. I didn't believe it, because I said, Peter, this is the United States of America. There's a peaceful transfer of power. The new, election, the new president has been elected. And what I, when I think about it, was just trying to grasp and to hold on to was the norm that we've had until then that the winner of an election gets inaugurated. There's, there's a peaceful transfer of power. That was shattered on January 6th. And that's been true with a lot of other norms, including in the world of journalism, uh, where norms have been shattered. And that's what I think is so dangerous, because that capacity to have that benefit of, and this is where community is so important, to, to have trust and to have some grace and to have some uh, restraint when you disagree with somebody or when you lose. Uh, that's been shattered. And that's what is the big worry I have about our democracy. And it's why I think what we do in Vermont is so profoundly important. I mean, the local journalism is one element of that. But even in our politics, uh, there's always been, I think, uh, a recognition that uh, you have to deal with people who disagree with you and the fact they disagree is not a reason to indict them or dislike them. Uh, so I am worried about it, but it also makes me redouble my efforts in my small way that I can to try to help knit us uh, back together. And that's really something I see uh, is a service uh, that each one of you 
uh, lives every single day. So I'm grateful to you for that. All right, Richard's giving me the hook. Thank you, thank you so much, thank Senator you. Welsh. Yeah, thank you all very much. Really appreciate all you do. We are so lucky to have <laughs> such. Yeah, they know better. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank um, Richard. Yeah. By the way, I work for this. Guy. I've worked for almost everybody in this room. I worked for this guy once, <laughs> and that was a pleasure. Uh, we're going to go right on to our next panel. We're going to pull up the three chairs. So now we're going to dive a little deeper into the nuances of some of the public policy initiatives, including some thinking here in Vermont, but also what's happening around the. Do we need to pull? Cheers. Okay. Okay. So um, some really interesting things happening around the country at the state level. New York, Illinois, California. Anna's going to fill us in on all of that. And then some folks here in Vermont are what they're thinking about. But feel free to jump up, move around. But we are going to go right into this panel, I believe. Um, Come on up, you guys, and we'll grab some. Oh, I think we're rolling in the big fancy chairs. That's what we're doing. <laughs> More coffee over there. There's still fruit in the back. All right, grab a seat. This is going to be, in many ways, an extension of the conversation we just had. We're going to talk in a little bit more detail about what's possible for policy solutions in helping local news thrive at both the state level and the national level, and what some of the substantive and political hurdles are to those things. So let me first introduce my three esteemed guests. To my left is Sarah Copeland Hansis. Sarah is the Vermont's 39th Secretary of State. She was elected in November 2022. She has lived, gone to school, and worked in Vermont since 1971. Her life and career have always centered on service. Sarah has been an educator, a youth coach, a small business owner, and a state legislator. During her 18-year legislative career, she served as majority leader. She was co-chair of the Climate Solutions Caucus and chair of the House Government Operations Committee. Sarah served on the executive committee of the National Conference of State Legislatures. She's passionate about civics and has made civic education and engagement a major priority for her office. She is currently co-chair of the National Association of Secretaries of State International Relations Committee. Sarah lives in Bradford with her husband, John, and they have three adult children. Uh, moving down the line, let me introduce to you Andy, Andrew Perchlick. Andrew has been a Vermont state senator since 2018. He represents the 23 towns in the Washington Senate District. A strong advocate for civic engagement and renewable energy, he was the founding executive director of the Trade Association Renewable Energy Vermont. And for the past 14 years, he's been director of the Clean Energy Development Fund at Vermont Public Service Department. He has been a select board member and chair, a justice of the peace, and a volunteer firefighter in Marshfield. And two of my favorite points from his resume, he has been both a Vermont VISTA volunteer and a Peace Corps volunteer in rural Panama. And down at the end is Anna Brugman, who joined us from Washington, DC. Thank you for flying in, Anna. Anna is the Director of Policy at Rebuild Local News. She's covered county government, education, and healthcare for local publications in Florida and Missouri. She studied the intersection of antitrust policy and the local press while an intern at Open Markets Institute. And her journalism has appeared in the Washington Post and Washington Monthly. Anna has studied audience trust and taught media literacy while also a Peace Corps volunteer in Albania. Thank you for being here. I'm so excited to have you all. Um, so what I'd like to do first is to start at the national level. Um, and if you could give us an overview of the national trends in state policy solutions. Some of them are states and a few of them are cities, but there are essentially um, a few thematic approaches to these policy pieces. And 
If you're wondering, um, Rebuild Local News has a fantastic guide on their website. They're, they're tracking all of this activity around the country, and they have a nice little um, a, a kind of simple guide to the, the different ways to tackle this um, from tax benefit credits to uh, you know, employment uh, promotion. So these are like, you can find it all there. But I'm going to let Anna take it away and give us an overview. Sure. Hi. Um, can you hear me all right? Uh, so I don't have to do most of the stump speech because Senator Welch already did it so well. So I can skip right to the specifics. Um, I always caveat any discussion on public policy. If public policy can solve one problem or maybe two, um, and we have a whole lot of challenges facing local news, so we're going to need a whole lot of policies at the federal, state, and local level, which is why Rebuild Local News um, works with our coalition members. We have about 35 different um, trade associations, industry groups, labor unions, journalism advocates that work together um, to advocate for smart public policies for the future of the local press. Um, we are values-based. We are not model-based, which is why we have a policy menu and a, and a tracker on our website, um, because we are not going into any jurisdiction and saying, like, this is the bill. Um, we evaluate public policies based on whether they're content neutral or are we empowering anybody to decide what is and isn't journalism. We're all journalists at Rebuild Local News. That would be our nightmare. Um, are they platform neutral? That actually means medium neutral. Um, we don't really care if you are a broadcaster um, or you are a, a digital nonprofit or a print nonprofit or a commercial print outlet. Um, if you hire journalists, if they do journalism, if they live in your community, then we think you should benefit from public policy. The same on future friendly. That looks at business model. Um, if the future of local news is co-op podcasts, then we want our public policies to include co-op podcasts. Um, 15 years ago, we could have never predicted that we have more than 450 nonprofit newsrooms in the United States, and yet we do, many of which are in Vermont. Um, we also <laughs> look at the degree to which public policies are going to support small and medium players. That's not because we don't think large news outlets are important, but that's because large news outlets, for the most part, have their own advocates. We want to bring the public policy discussion to people who either don't have the resources or have been historically not included in the public policy discussion, which is why we focus on small and medium players. Um, we also look at public policies that are likely to result in more journalists and communities. That's not always going to be our metric for success, but right now we've lost 60% of a uh, newspaper newsroom journalists in the last 20-ish years. Um, I saw uh, that there was a study in Vermont that, that said you lost 75% um, of your reporters in the last 20 years. We can just all agree there's just not enough bodies. We don't have enough people. And until we deal with that issue, we can't deal with issues of we need to do audience engagement better. We need to do this better um, because we just don't have enough people. Um, and not having enough people generally comes to not having enough money. Um, so we also look at public policies um, that are likely to broadly benefit wide swaths of the field. Um, again, that's not always going to be our strategy. Um, but. Peace Corps volunteers. We uh, <laughs> um, we were often encouraged to think about the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Don't go into your community and uh, introduce a poetry club if your students don't have reliable electricity. Um, think about what <laughs> think about where your community is at and create projects that meet their needs. Um, Think about, you know, something that you can do in the daytime if you don't have a reliable electricity in your community. Um, and so the Maslow's hierarchy of needs right now for local journalism, I really feel, is, you know, we're at food, water, shelter. We need more bodies in the room. We need more operational funds so that newsrooms um, can be more creative uh, and serve their communities better. So that said, <laughs> public policies that do that. Um, Right now, we're seeing a really interesting session for something that we call the employment subsidy, which sounds really boring, but it's so exciting. Um, it's a tax credit that incentivizes the hiring and retention of journalists. Um, New York, Illinois, uh, both passed versions of this this session. And California has a really interesting approach that you already mentioned um, that I can absolutely get into details with. Um, there are, that deals. That addresses the bodies in the room problem, right? Because we're incentivizing the higher retention of journalism by offering newsrooms a refundable tax credit based on the number of journalists that you have on staff and what they're paid. Um, and that also gets newsrooms 
broad operating money. Um, a newsroom, um, so I'll, I'll use the Illinois example, uh, where it's 15K per journalist if they're already on staff and 25K if they're a journalist that's been hired um, in that tax year. And so you have, if you have two journalists on staff and you hire one that year, that's 55K. Um, you could hire in some cases and in some towns with 55K. And now you've just, uh, by 25% uh, increased your newsroom. Um, and if anybody works at a newsroom with three folks, you know <laughs> the difference that fourth person can make. Um, and so that is an approach that I'm really, really fond of. I think you can incentivize a lot of good behaviors, both from chains um, that may not have the best uh, employment behaviors, and also really support small players who are trying to scale their efforts with that policy. Um, I kind of put that under the bucket of like the pipeline, of like how are we supporting the hiring and retention fellowship programs, or another way you could do that a little bit further back um, on the pipeline. Uh, Washington, California, New Mexico all have publicly funded fellowship programs. Um, New Mexico, I think, is probably the most scalable. California got a $25 million lump sum grant, and um, there are a few states in which $25 million can fall from the sky, <laughs> um, California being one of them, but uh, very few others. New Mexico launched a fellowship program um, through the New Mexico Fund for Local News in partnership with the University of New Mexico. Um, and then after running the fellowship and internship program for about two or three years, um, went to the state leg legislature for appropriation and they are now up to, I have to do the mental math, $320,000 over three years um, from the state legislature. Um, and they really focused on rural first. They put their first fellows in rural communities. Um, and that really allowed them to go to legislatures on both sides of the aisle and talk about it as a jobs program. This is about jobs. This is about us being able to keep local talent in their local communities and keep local voices local. And that's really resonated with folks on both sides of the aisle in New Mexico. Mexico. Um, and I think it's far more scalable than waiting for that $25 million to fall from the sky, though we love that for California. That's great. <laughs> um, Washington also launched, I, I think it was smaller, I think it was in the order of like $4 million, um, but they have eight fellows um, over the next couple of years. Um, the other two things I'll mention is government advertising. So the government is an advertiser. Um, Advertisements you see placed about you know, roads being closed and public notices, um, those are all advertisements that governments place. Some of those advertisements are not discretionary, meaning there are statutes that govern how and when those uh, advertisements are placed. Some are discretionary. So New York City, uh, established a mandate that a certain portion of those government advertising dollars must go to what they called community and ethnic news, um, which was generally speaking the hyper-local press in New York City because what they found was that about three publications, the Post, the Daily News, and the Times in New York City um, were accounting for about 88% um, of discretionary advertising dollars in the city. And so the, the problem that they were trying to solve for um, was a disbursement problem. In San Francisco, they also passed a mandate to um, be transparent about where government advertising dollars are spent um, with a strongly worded encouragement for agencies to spend with local news. And the problem that they are trying to solve for um, is tech, <laughs> is that a lot of those advertising dollars they found after doing a study um, were being dumped in search and platforms. Um, and it really decreased the amount that was going to local journalism, period. Um, regardless of whether it was a large Metro Daily or whether it was a hyper-local neighborhood publication or community-specific publication um, or a language-specific publication, they just had a tech problem. Um, and so they're going about it from a transparency lens, which I think is really smart because having uh, worked with folks trying to establish how much money goes or where the government advertising funds go, it's quite difficult. <laughs> um, I had a very smart grad student at UMD um, who has a background in, um, in computer sciences and coding languages, and he created three different databases and still had like blank spaces um, about where the government advertising go was going in Maryland, um, which tells me <laughs> that we have a transparency problem in addition to a spending problem, and it's really hard to solve that spending problem without also, without starting from the transparency point of view. So that's telling. The last thing I'll mention, um, and then I'll stop talking, uh, is consumer subsidy. And so uh, when we kind of started this whole thing, um, there was something called the Local Journalism Sustainability Act, uh, which some of you will remember uh, from the Build Back Better days. There was a plank of that in 
included in Build Back Better. Um, but the Local Journalism Sustainability Act was a bill introduced um, back in the 117th Congress uh, by, oh my gosh, I have to remember my 117th Congress. <laughs> that feels years ago. Um, by uh, Kirkpatrick and uh, Washington, uh, Sorry, sir. Um, a Washington rep who is uh, not running for re-election. I'm so embarrassed that I can't remember his name. Um, on the and that was a bipartisan bill on the House side. On the Senate side, Senator Cantwell um, was and it continues to be our champion. Um, and that bill included a subscription tax credit, and so that would be a tax credit for folks who subscribe or donate to local newsrooms. Um, what we found was the implementation for that would have been quite difficult. And that's why it's not in the Community News and Small Business Support Act, because it would have benefited folks who have no tax liability or have a high tax liability and itemize quite deeply, and almost no one in between. Um, and obviously, from a consumer point of view, a, a, a partitioned benefit is not going to have the effect that we'd like. Um, Washington, D.C. introduced a bill that's very interesting, and I'm very excited about it, that creates um, what we call a news coupon program in Washington. It's called a news voucher program in Seattle. Um, but essentially, uh, the bill would, and it's been introduced and it's not been heard yet, um, it's likely to get a hearing sometime this year, but the bill would set aside part of DC's general fund. Um, in DC, I think it's 0.1%, which amounts to like 11.5 million um, in the district, and it would create a democratized grant program. So every resident of the district, including myself, uh, would get five news coupons to allocate to the newsrooms of their choice. And the newsrooms would receive the proportion, the same proportion of the, of the fund as they got in coupons. And so the coupons don't have a hard value in DC. Um, and that's really to ensure that regardless of uptake in the first couple of years, newsrooms still see um, the benefit of the program. Um, and so that is really exciting to us because we've wrestled with this consumer side problem. Um, obviously, one of the challenges we all face is, is encouraging folks to donate or subscribe to our news outlets. Um, and this does it in a way that I think is broader than the subscription tax credit approach. So I'm really excited to see um, DC take that up. Um, and those are some of the trends we're seeing nat nationally. There are more. Um, <laughs> and I'm happy to go into detail in California. Um, but I think the problems that we're trying to solve right now um, in many communities are, yes, Absolutely, we just need more reporters, fellowship programs, employment subsidies. We need to encourage folks um, to subscribe or donate to local news. Um, we need to get folks broad operating money um, in ways that are compatible with their business model, government advertising as well. That's great, thank you. That's really uh, useful context for talking about what's possible in Vermont. And um, it's nice that these templates have been kind of laid and tested in a lot of places. Also, shout out to the state of New York, which earlier this spring passed the most ambitious bill thus far, I believe, in supporting, California's especially on, on the tails, hiring side. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I think we have a, a SUNY in the house. If Elaine is here, give us a little wave. Uh, <laughs> yes, very, doing very important work there uh, with the, the state of New York, um, which has made local news a priority. Yeah. That's it. I'm not, you don't have to do anything at all. I'm just giving you a shout out. <laughs> Um, so let, I, I want to talk now about what's, what we can do, what can actually, what's actually implementable here in the state. Um, but let me, let me start first with um, uh, Secretary Hansis Sarah, if you can just tell us. Sarah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I know that civic information and engagement is really a priority for you. Can you tell us a little bit about how is local news a part of your thinking in this, in your programming? And um, what's already being done? And if you have a hunch of how, with how it might intersect with a uh, new policy? Thank you for that question. Um, you know, I think, I think we all understand in this room that a, a vibrant and engaged uh, local media is essential in a democracy. Uh, some of us stayed up late last night watching some coverage of something that affects us nationally. Um, but, uh, but every single one of us is much more impacted by what happens um, in our local communities uh, and in the state of Vermont. And so 
our office is really focused on civic outreach and civic engagement um, it, with the intent of helping people understand that it is these local uh, select board and city councilors, your local lawmaker uh, who's serving in Montpelier, who are going to have a, uh, an outsized impact on your life, on your world, on your um, the policies that impact your family. Um, we have teamed up with, uh, with a number of different um, kinds of local media. I think uh, mo primarily the, the, the shout out that I would give uh, with regard to how the Secretary of State's office is supporting local media is we are now uh, the granting agency for the Vermont Access Network, the, the cable access television uh, stations um, get their, their grant from the legislature through us. And I think that's an important starting point because it means that in the event we do move towards some public policies that, uh, that support local media uh, in, in other types of media, uh, we are well poised to, uh, to, to be the facilitating state agency. And it is very much in line with our uh, mission you know, the Secretary of State, uh, as the keeper of the state archives, is all about transparency. You live in a democracy. You should know what your government is doing on your behalf. And who is more essential in uh, supplying that on a daily, weekly, monthly basis than you all, who are keeping track of what our government is doing on our behalf? Um, so we really want to be uh, in the conversation. We want to be supporting uh, the, the ideas that you come with. And, and what I really hope will come out of this day, um, now that Anna has given us a great rundown of uh, some menu of ideas, is think about how each of those might impact your place of employment and your job. And which of those do you think we could use it, uh, you know, maybe through an act of the legislature or an appropriation um, to really leverage uh, what we have in Vermont, which I think is a generally um, engaged uh, citizenry who understands the importance of media in transparency in government. Thank you. That's a really great way to think about it. It's like to really like walk this right up to the moment of implementation to think about what these ideas would feel like if we tried to make them happen here, uh, which is one of the things that we'd love to come out of this day is some concrete ideas. With that in mind, we'll turn to what our elected, another elected official, Senator Perch, like what kinds of legislation do you think would you like to see in this space and what do you think is possible? Yeah, thanks. I think Tax credits are, are a, often seen as an easy thing to do, but I, but I thought in Vermont with our nonprofit community news is organizations that tax credits aren't gonna be as useful here. You can make them refundable, but then it I think just gets more complicated. Um, there are difficulties in tax credits as tax expenditures because of the expenditure of those funds in, and given the shortage of funds that we have and the feeling that once you have a tax credit, they're hard to take away. And so those of us that are concerned about the amount of money we have are usually don't like tax credits in that way because it's something that just kind of can run away from you as far as what the expenditures are. So I, I, I like the idea of, of supporting the organizations that way. Um, but what I'm, the idea that I had that I, if we can come up with the money, if we find a pot of money, then it's a one-time, expenditure so it's very clear the dollar amount and we do it to provide direct assistance to civic local news organizations that are supporting our democracy and i just wanted to say like peace corps volunteers think the same way because i also have a diagram here of maslow's hierarchy of needs <laughs> because i was thinking about that what is the democracy's hierarchy of needs and where does journalism and uh, you know independent free journalism stack up in there and I would say it's somewhere in the top of that pyramid and so we need to support that if we're going to have a functional democracy 
Um, so my idea is to have basically awards for civic engagement for local journalism. But the original idea was that we would run it through the Secretary of State's office because we did move the community access TV over there. We've tried to support that. We did pass some legislation more this year to give them some more money. And we purposely moved it over to the Secretary of State's as a civic engagement issue instead of, it used to be with the utility regulators. It was just seen of as, as kind of a utility regulation thing that we would provide funding for community access TV. So we wanted to build on the civic work that was happening in the Secretary of State's office and say they could offer awards. Let's say they're $10,000 awards to those organizations that are just exemplarily doing the work of everything we've talked about of the value of local news organizations. Because one, you could give them a little bit of money that way, but I thought also it was important to educate the public on the importance of these organizations, that it's something worthy of an award and something of the opportunity to highlight it in that way of saying, hey, we won an award. But just a chance to you know shake the tambourines and throw confetti and celebrate the good work that organizations are doing, and that's important. I no longer think we should run it through the Secretary of State's office, not because I don't love Sarah, but I think there's a problem if you have elected officials giving awards to news organizations that you want to be covering those elected officials. So I think it makes more sense for somebody like the Community News Center or somebody like that nonpartisan group that just knows about news organizations issuing those awards and we could do an appropriation to some organization that, that's a trusted organization that could give out these awards, give out these cash awards. So I don't know, it's not as a long standing program to support these organizations, but it's something that I think would raise awareness of the need and uh, as also provide some funding. But I think, I don't know if tax credits are the right thing for Vermont for the nonprofits that we have, but something like that I think is also uh, possible. Thank you, and thank you for your, for being so specific. I, that's really interesting. I'd love to give Sarah a chance to respond right now. Yeah. Yes, first of all, I'm gonna say thank you to the senator for, um, for, for offering to remove my office from the need of uh, <laughs> evaluating the the uh, relative value of, of different organizations. I mean, the wonderful thing about the Van Grant is uh, that it it comes in, it goes out, you all figure out what, what you're going to do with it. Um, that certainly makes a lot of sense. I wanna just give a shout out to a, a couple of other ideas that I think are worthy of thinking about and that really are in keeping with uh, with some of the work that my office is doing. Um, number one, we should be thinking about where we're using our advertising dollars. I don't know how many of you are regularly on social media in Vermont, but we do see a lot of our uh, state agencies from the Vermont State Police to the Health Department uh, to the Agency of Natural Resources doing um, paid sponsorship ads on social media. And, and that's great and wonderful. I, I, you know, I'll be honest, our, our office is also on uh, the social media platforms in order to get our information in front of all viewers. Um, but we need to start prioritizing uh, government spending in advertising with the local news outlets as well. And I think that's a, a, a directive that, that would rightly come uh, from the legislature. It's, it's in fact something that we've already looked at as, uh, as our office is responsible for publishing um, uh, a warning of the upcoming consideration of a constitutional amendment. I went through and looked at the media outlets that, that I inherited from uh, previous administrations and realized that we no longer have a, you know, a single statewide media source. And so I said, you know, why don't we look at this geographically and make sure that we have uh, each corner of the state covered with some sort of print media uh, or digital media in order to uh, make sure that we have statewide coverage. Um, Sorry, before, just kind of jump on that real quick before you yeah. go to your next point. I wanted to also say that political advertising from elected officials or those that are running for office should also be focused on focused on, you can't regulate that, I don't think, although there are other countries that do that kind of regulation, but the politicians that spend their money on Facebook and Instagram and not with the local newspapers, I think should be called out for it. I have made a pledge not to do any advertising on social media, but only provide my advertising dollars 
to local media, just because I think it's important uh, for democracy. And I want to see other politicians doing that, of saying that they will make that pledge, or even if it's not all of it, that it's a, a portion of it, that they make that kind of commitment. So I think it's not only uh, government agencies advertising, but our, uh, us that are in elected office advertising. So the other, uh, the other shout out that I want to give um, is really in keeping with uh, the youth engagement and the civics education work that our office has been doing. Because when we think about the opportunities for a, a voucher or a consumer subsidy, we really should be thinking about how do we get more papers into more classrooms as a teaching tool, as a learning tool, and oh, by the way, this is the textbook this week and take it home and your family can look at it when you're done with it. Um, given the challenges that we've had passing school budgets this year, I'm not gonna suggest that this is something that we could mandate um, on the state level uh, as an expense, but I think it's something that we should think about uh, how we provide, how we begin um, populating uh, this idea with different school districts around the state um, because it's an excellent source of subscribership for our local media and it's critical for, uh, as Andy said, uh, to keep the folks in a geographic area um, in touch with and aware of, of what their local elected officials are doing because you all are covering them and uh, what they're saying about their uh, re-election campaigns if they're advertising there. So I think the, the voucher program in particular, focusing it on um, integrating into school classrooms would be critical. Thank you. Um, really interesting ideas. And I, I, I want to circle back eventually to what the precedence is for this in other states. Um, but before we do that, I'd love to hear from all of you. Are there questions for our panelists? Anybody have a question that you would like to? Yes. And say your name if you would, Lisa, and maybe even what you do. Hi, thanks for taking my question. I'm Lisa Loomis with The Valley Reporter, and I'm president of the Vermont Press Association. My question for all of you as you talk about grants and stipends for news organizations that are dedicated to providing local news is how will you surmount the issue of giving public funding to for-profit organizations? Anna, do you want to hit that first? Yeah, that's a, um, uh, thank you for asking that question. Um, on the, so New Jersey has the New Jersey Information Consortium, which is an independent collection of universities um, that allocate grant funds. It's given out $5.5 million in grants since it was created in 2018. Um, I think that grant programs, first of all, from a meta level, are fantastic, um, but that's not what we would call a broad-based program. That's not an entitlement. It's a discretionary program. Um, there are ways that you can create discretionary programs through taxes <laughs> or, or through grants um, by basically kind of uh, creating a lump sum and then using the same criteria for identifying how much money you would get, but allocating it through a grant, not a tax incentive. On the for-profit issue, um, I think infrastructure is really important in this case. And so you as a press association, do you have a press association foundation? Um, so that could ask, <laughs> uh, so that could act as uh, potentially a fiscal sponsor for some um, for-profit entities that do not have the capacity to take in grants. It is an issue and it is really important that we talk about how we are going to um, include for-profit entities in this future of local news. That's why Rebuild Local News has a has a medium neutral point of view because I'm from central Missouri. Um, what would work in central Missouri would not work where I live now in Washington, DC. If I walked into my hometown in central Missouri and said, I wanna create a news vouchers program, um, I would get laughed out of city council. <laughs> Maybe not city council, county uh, commission, definitely. Um, and so we want to stay medium neutral because we think every community knows what it needs and knows how to figure that out. And we want to create funds that are broad enough for communities to figure out this problem um, and solve this problem in a way in which they have information that is reliable for decades to come. Um, so back to the infrastructure point. Press associations are fantastic. Another, um, the university could be another piece of infrastructure that could support um, commercial entities taking advantage of grant dollars. Um, the North Carolina has a, two really good entities actually. They're just like uh, full of infrastructure. They have the uh, North Carolina Fund for Local News and they have the North Carolina Local News Workshop. I think both of those entities are really important. The workshop provides both training um, and opportunities for grant and the fund is obviously 
a fund. Um, that one's pretty straightforward. Um, so I, I I see Dale nodding in the front, and Press Forward has an infrastructure. Yeah, and in some, we're going to actually talk yeah. about how the philanthropic world is a bridge to a lot it's of a, these solutions in our next panel. Yes. So let's put a pin in that for now and go to another question. So one more here in the back. Libby. Hi, my name is Libby. Um, I'm from VT Digger. I was wondering, um, just like from a policy and organizing perspective, like who's moving, what entities are moving forward some of the laws and policies? Like are there, is it the press association or do you have lobbyists that work with Rebuild Local? Another great question. And to do with infrastructure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, I mean, it is like, it, it, Dale's going to get way more into infrastructure than I will, but it is a really important part of this because we can throw all the policy we want and then we're, we're, we're full of national level infrastructure, including lo rebuild local news. And then I walk into, um, Connecticut, for example, we had to build local infrastructure to advocate for a public policy because the press association wasn't big enough to advocate. They didn't represent the digital only. And so we literally had nothing and had to build um, a piece of infrastructure. And in that case, we hired a comms firm um, to work with us. And we also hired a lobbyist. What we would like to do, uh, what is more sustainable, I think, in the long term, um, is to find folks who are doing this at the state level. It could be a press association. It could be a local news workshop. It could be a university. Um, it could be just an ad hoc coalition. That's who really advanced the piece of policy in New York. Um, in California, an ad hoc coalition of independent and nonprofit news outlets um, pushed what is the most ambitious piece of journalism policy in the world at the moment, SB 1327, that just passed the, the California Senate. It. Um, I'd love to ask, it, it, I'm sorry to interrupt you, I'd love yeah. to just f put it, stop there for a moment and ask yeah. Senator Perch, like, what do you, do you feel like there's potential to get, um, is there a critical mass right now among elected officials in Vermont? I'm, I'm assuming so, but we don't know because do it really hasn't been a topic of discussion. Mm -hmm. So I think we do need somebody advocating for it in an organized way. It was something that I talked to Sarah and Richard this last session because we were interested, but it was like, well, you know, is this, I haven't heard from the news organizations. I had heard from Richard and other folks like that. So I wanted to know is, what is the thing that's gonna help these or news organizations, you know, the best also. I wanted to hear from them. So some kind of press organization that is there. I think they're probably feel awkward lobbying on their behalf. So some other entity doing that, I think that would be would and be the best news way to do it. Happy yeah. to have conversations with lobbyists. Yeah, so that's, and so, or like a national group says these are best practices. I just wanted to say for the first question about for profit. I mean, the government gives money to for profit corporations all the time. Uh, it's something I'm kind of critical of. But I think as far as hiring reporters would be a way to do that. We we have incentives for businesses to hire people across the economic sectors. Why not also do that in journalism? It would be easy to kind of add that yeah. as an economic development, yeah. Thank you. Um, Richard, how are we doing on time? Can we do another question? Um, maybe one more. Okay. Bill. Bill. Um, I'd love just a couple of succinct thoughts on the impact of the media of distribution on content. Now that we have terrestrial broadcast, internet, print, you know, how is that affecting? I mean, you can look on Vermont Digger, you can look on Vermont Public, and you have audio, video, and print. How is that impacting content? Well, let me first say that we do have some relatively new research that we compiled at the Center for Community News. Uh, Dan is in here somewhere who actually did all the legwork. He should give us a little wave if he can. Um, that looks at some of the sort of changing trends in the news that's created here in Vermont and um, the ways in which like we, we've seen print go down and um, some of the hidden in there is details about the emergence of digital media and things like that. Um, but I think, Bill, your question is about, are you talking about the substance, the quality or depth of the reporting we're talking about? Well, I think I'm not going to attempt to answer that question except to say that we are we are platform neutral here at the University of Vermont and we're excited about all smart news as as it emerges and 
Um, truly, one of the great lessons of this emerging generation of journalists is that all, all worthy reporting doesn't have to look like a traditional 600 word AP style inverted triangle news story. Like there really are other ways. And if you kind of even broaden the definition a little bit more to think about civic information and not exclusively reporting, um, you, can you can have an even more expansive definition of what valuable information looks like. So um, this is actually an area that I think we're really excited about. And I, Rebuild Local News, is, I think, has a similar position. Yeah, and we really think about it in terms of um, the, the information food chain. <laughs> um, and so, you know, you, I think you used the, the phrase, eat your vegetables, earlier with information. Um, newspapers still do the majority of original reporting. Um, and then that, and I would include, I, I use newspapers in the, the the post-internet sense, so that includes digital only and nonprofits as well. Um, public radio is increasing its its reporting um, its, its reporting ranks as well. Um, but when you think about a a food chain or a food pyramid, you need all of it. Um, and when we uh, broadcast and commercial broadcast often comes up a lot in these conversations. And is this going to benefit broadcasters too? And in some cases, no. And in some cases, yes. But the fact of the matter is a lot of communities get the majority of their news um, from commercial broadcast. Um, there's, uh, I think, a study. Um, I'm about to talk about Ohio in front of Dale. And that makes me really nervous. <laughs> Um, there was, I think it was Cincinnati that found that a large portion of Cincinnati residents were, uh, were were functionally illiterate, and broadcast was their main it was their was their main form Cleveland. of Cleveland. Cleveland, Cleveland. I'm so sorry. <laughs> See, I knew I was going to get in trouble. Um, Cleveland uh, was functionally illiterate, and broadcast was their main source of information. And so, no, broadcast news is not seeing the kind of market failure um, that we're seeing in newspapers. But they're still really really important in the ecosystem. So they will be in, included. Um, um, in some uh, in some public policies, and they won't be in others. There's, I, I won't take you down our full policy menu of, of what does and doesn't include commercial broadcast. But I think for, to your point of can you do um, a deep amount of reporting in a video? It might not look like it looks like in a newspaper where you've got you know 1,500 words. But if a if a broadcaster ends up taking that 1,500 words and making it consumable to somebody who is not going to read that article in the information food chain, in the information ecosystem, I still think it's really important that that exists. Um, and so that's how I think about that. That's not really answering your question. I think, when, <laughs> I, I, I think from an ethical perspective, um, all, everything needs to start with um, a, a human being yeah. doing on the ground reporting, and it all needs to trace back from that. So, if 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 several iterations down the road, all of the same facts, the same facts are being conveyed through a TikTok video, as long as like it, it's all starting from those same kind of society of journalists' ethical uh, principles, then I do think that we can think really creatively about it. I'd like to give our guests a chance to disagree with any of the things that we've yeah. said. Up here. <laughs> so, Bill, I appreciate the question, and um, you know, I am not a uh, the head of a media outlet, but as the chief elections official in Vermont, in an age of mis and disinformation about how elections work, um, we do have to think like uh, like a, a media outlet. So, we use that video content as more of a of a hook and an invitation. So, we might link. Uh, to a news article that goes into more depth about a particular topic. Or we might hook and then say, you know, visit your My Voter page at mvp.vermont.gov if you want more information. Um, and so we're thinking of it as how do we catch you where you are, where you are already consuming media, and then how do we invite you to come deeper with us? Thank you. I, I yeah, just want ahead. to say I agree that we need to have a, a broader sense of what is an in-depth article because there are some people that, yeah, will we'll never read the article, but they might watch the community access TV of the select board or they'll listen to a podcast. I think the work that Erica Heilman has done with Rumble Strip has been really great for Vermont, and I think that kind of journalism is really important, and we just need to kind of broaden that, that perspective to be a healthy food pyramid.
And I, I can see Richard lurking here. He's giving us the hook very soon. I just want to give a plug. Um, I hope that every one of you who are journalists in Vermont already have, uh, are on Brian Mills' um, uh, distribution list. He's our chief of staff, and he is in charge of making sure that you all get information about what's coming out of our office, which will include all of that important information about upcoming election deadlines. So if you don't know Brian, uh, introduce yourself to him. He's sitting right up here. All right, I think we have to we have to wrap it, but a lot of these questions are going to come up in our next panel, I imagine. Thank you to the panel. Thank you so much. <laughs> Ten minute break, and then we're going to hear about this major new initiative in Vermont. Yes, come back. Move around. Hey everybody, I'm Scott Finn. Um, I have been in local news pretty much for my entire career in West Virginia, in Florida, and in Vermont, most recently at Vermont Public. And hello to all my former colleagues that are in the crowd. We're well represented here. Um, and I believe that public media is a huge part of rebuilding local news. Um, now I'm working with the Center for Community News, helping them to uh, use students to help do community journalism across the country, especially with public media stations. But today we're here to talk about Press Forward, and I'd like to introduce our panel. We have, and we're very fortunate to have, Dale Anglin from Press Forward. She is the first director of the National Press Forward Initiative starting in February. Um, and before then, as a deep, a deep background in philanthropy and community development, including at the Cleveland Foundation, where she was involved in, um, in funding community news. We also have Dan Smith. Most of you all know Dan. For eight years, he's been the leader of the Vermont Community Foundation um, and uh, has uh, had several initiatives, including, including closing the opportunity gap and playing a huge role in a, a bunch of recent disasters in Vermont, including recovery from COVID. COVID and from the floods last year. And so they're up here to talk about what you might have seen announced today, which is Press Forward Vermont, which is our new Press Forward chapter. So please give them a big round of applause. Thank them for being here. All right, we're gonna get to questions really quick, but I, I think there are a couple of questions everybody has. And so Dale, first question is, what is Press Forward? Thank you. It's called Press, I'm in a university, so it's the Press Forward Five Minutes of 101. Um, so Press Forward was started back in September. Uh, staff started in, sept in February. I think I'm a hundred and something days on the job. And it really was started, um, you've already had all the panels that talk about our problems with local news, how important local news is incredibly for our communities, for our democracy. One of the groups that was not organized in that space was philanthropy. And so similar to the ways that philanthropy has supported the arts for a long time and housing and economic development and education, is could we put journalism in that mix? And that hadn't happened before in the, in the philanthropy space, partly because journalism didn't need philanthropy for a long time. You had other ways of having of, of bringing in revenue, even though it's changed a lot over the last ten years. It takes philanthropy a while to catch up. I will just say we're a little slow at times. So we really was started to bring philanthropy to this space. So we started with 22 funders uh, in fall of 2023. We're now up to 62 funders. We're including both staffed foundations and individual donors. We have three pillars, four pillars, because uh, you, you can't do everything, you can't boil the ocean. One is equity, because we know that in the past, the way that news was delivered, the way it was covered, um, the way it was structured was not equitable. There are many, many communities that were left out, many languages, many types of people were left out. So if you want to build it back, you got to build it back better. Infrastructure, because any industry needs infrastructure to think about how to build capacity and support HR and all sorts of things to make sure that industry is strong. Um, uh, policy, which you heard a lot about. Uh, we are really, I am ridiculously excited about our policy working committee and we're gonna be working with Anna and her team a lot. And then the last one, which is why we're here today, is locals. And so we knew that national foundations, even though we've pledged $500 million over five years, and we want to double that. But even that is not enough for what we need to bring all the journalists back, or some portion of the journalists back. 
And so how can we stimulate on the local level? I call them tables. Because this is not an, someone said early, there's, no, not, there's never gonna be one solution to fix journalism. There are multiple issues in this, in this field right now. We have a terminology problem, we have a communications problem, we have a talent problem, we have an audience problem. There's not gonna be one uh, specific technical solution. So what we figure is you need groups of people in community, however you define it, state, city, region, to be sitting at a table together over a long period of time, in Vermont you've already done this actually, um, to think together about what should that ecosystem look like? How do we bring funders into it? What are some of the things that we need to emphasize over others right now if something's happening in your region? That just hasn't happened. We have a few places that have had kind of media collaboratives, but not enough. And so these forward, these chapters, we have 25 now in 20 states, and we hope to have at least one in every state a year from now, is to set the table, starting with funders, but not exclusively to funders. I tell people in a year, it should not be funders talking to funders. It should be funders talking with their outlets, talking with their journalism support organizations, working with their press associations, to sit and think deeply about what does the ecosystem look like now? Who's missing? How do we get more funds in? How do we build capacity? How do we support our journalists, who I think of these days as frontline workers, because that's what you are? Um, but you're not gonna solve that in a year or two, right? So we don't need a collaborative that's only here for a year or two. We need a collaborative for the next five to 10 years. You guys have done some of that in Vermont. Um, a few other places have done it. But that's the point of the chapters, is to do that work. Press Forward is here to really support that and to bring up, bring many more funders, high net worth individuals, regular residents to understand the import, what local news is to them, the importance of it to our democracy, and why everybody, philanthropy down to the individual resident, has got to figure out ways to financially support it as much as they can. Thank you, Dale. And I, I imagine everyone saw this, or if you haven't, there's a press release printed out in the back. Um, the Vermont Community Foundation this morning announced the formation of the Press Forward Vermont chapter, right? Press Forward Vermont. And I know that it's brand new, but Dan, what are you thinking that it is and might be, and what is it not? Well, <clears throat> thanks, Scott. And like, first, let me just start by saying thank you to Dale for taking the time to come and visit. Um, because it's a, w a wonderful thing to be able to benefit from the experiences and the network that is being built on a national level uh, to help address the challenges that are arising across Vermont. I want to start a little bit about by talking about where where I how I come from uh, where I come from when I think about this issue. Um, first and foremost, my first job out of high school was in the newsroom at WDEV, working for a news director named Anson Tebbett. Some of you may know him as the current Secretary of Agriculture. Um, they gave me a, a cell phone in a suitcase. I covered everything from uh, the Bristol outhouse race in the, in the parade that they used to do. I see Bill Schubart nodding about the outhouse race. Uh, uh, harness races up in the kingdom to Governor Dean's press conference. This was about 1993, so Dean had been in, the, in office for about two Two years. Uh, some of the students in the community news service may or not even have been born at that point. <clears throat> um, but what was fascinating to me about and important about that experience and about WDEV in that moment um, and uh, about local journalism broadly is the reflection of community and the ability it holds uniquely to connect people to each other and to place. I mean, Senator Welch talked about it a little bit. You know, you disagree at town meeting and you, uh, you show up at hockey practice and you gotta navigate those disagreements civilly. There's a unique role for you all as journalists to sustain that. And another friend on the way in here said, you know what, people will support and consume and pay for journalism that is informed by trust and place. And those two things are built over time. Uh, and so I think, uh, I think that's a key piece that we all hold. I'm gonna make the, I'm gonna take the risk of quoting a technologist in this room. Uh, but Bill Gates once said, you, can, you tend to overestimate how much progress can be made in a year and underestimate how much progress can be made in five or 10 years. 
Um, so our interest in building this initiative and working with Dale and the team at Press Forward is really to un better understand the systems and infrastructure that are necessary to sustain local newsrooms across uh, this state. Um, <clears throat> that for us lands in an impact area the Community Foundation, by definition, is generalists. You know, our approach is to pursue community vitality across, across right now five impact areas. This lands in an impact area that is focused on democracy and civic innovation. Um, understanding that absent transparency and uh, uh, visibility into democra uh, democ democratic decision-making and civic institutions, it's really hard for us to navigate those things constructively and pursue progress, the progress that we need to see. Um, I also say that I come at it from the perspective of the trajectory of Vermont communities. And by a as a, somebody in philanthropy, I'm by definition optimistic and I'm intended to be hopeful. But I have to say, I, I just spent two days in Springfield, Vermont, uh, at the, and I, uh, a couple of panels down there, was Vermont Council of Rural Development Board Retreat, a couple of panels down there reminded me that 40 years ago, Springfield was the wealthiest community in the state in the span of a few years with the collapse of the tool and die industry, families went from being members in the country club up on the hill above town to being on state support. Things happen like that in the course of a lifetime to industry and to communities. So if we are not intentional about the collaborations we create, the things in which we rely are deeply fragile. Um, so I will tell you that as generalists in, uh, in community development from the Community Foundation standpoint. Our collaboration with Press Forward in this initiative comes from a place of curiosity. What is our role and what is the role of philanthropy in building and sustaining the infrastructure that will make local news and journalism sustainable and vibrant into the future so the communities that rely on it are also sustainable and vibrant into the future. Um, so I'll pause there. I think that's a really good place to, to pause because what I'm hearing in this is that this is a process, this Press Forward Vermont chapter is just beginning. Right, you, there is no application form to fill out. There is no grants being made. There's not even the criteria for that yet. You're in the process of figuring out what's needed. Uh, that's right. I mean, so uh, the press release went out this morning. The conversation with Press Forward uh, National started a, a few months ago. Um, our democracy impact area has been taking shape over the last six or seven months. There are a couple other pieces of that puzzle. We don't yet have a grant program in which people can uh, to which people can apply. And frankly, we are only able to do what we can raise money to do. Um, so what we're hoping this provides is a venue through which state-based philanthropists, people who care about their communities, people who are committed to seeing this as an angle for change, will be able to put, put resources that can then go into creating the system and structures that make local journalism sustainable. Um, the way we've approached our programming in the past is a useful, um, uh, a useful analogy just to set some expectations. Um, we tend to look for systems level partners who are working on things on a broad basis, who can help set the stage for healthier systems. Uh, and then we look for grassroots partners. Um, we wanna see local newsrooms able to thrive because the stories that are told locally need to be listened, heard, and reported locally. Um, so I, I imagine our approach will reflect that. Um, we are, you know, we are actively in the process of raising funds for the Press Forward Initiative Fund. Um, but again, this nests in a broad range of community development and community activities that we uh, see as vital for the vitality of Vermont communities going forward. But we see this as a fundamental piece of our civic infrastructure that is currently unattended and somewhat complicated for philanthropy to wrestle with. Yeah, I'll just add that um, one of the one of the things we're learning is press forwards national and the locals are sitting in the middle between philanthropy, the outlets, the journalism support organizations, and the community. 
And one thing we're finding is that those four groups don't all even describe local news in the same way. Somebody cares about investigative, somebody cares about civic, somebody cares about youth, somebody cares about policy. I, I, we literally, when people come and talk to me, I, I try to guess which area they are in and put them in that bucket. So local news has a, has a terminology problem. I stopped using the term, I, I helped start a nonprofit news uh, initiative in Cleveland called, and now in the state of Ohio called Signal. We're 18 months old and we're in three cities. We're about to be, I just found out we're about to get a grant. We're gonna open a state house. I'm very excited. But I stopped using the term journalism. Because when I was talking to our residents, it didn't resonate with them. They just had, you know, Woodward and Bernstein in their heads. Um, and we started using news and information and all sorts of words. And that resonated with them. They were like, oh, well, I get my news from so-and-so down the street. Um, so these days, as we're talking to funders and people, residents who you want to support this, we're trying to think through as Press Forward National and working with all our local chapters is what are the words that people will resonate with? They may be different and that's okay because we're talking the same thing but sometimes a little different depending on who you're talking to. What we've got to figure out, I tell people what's the equivalent of, for local news, what's the Got Milk campaign? That we're all using some phrase, some way of describing this ridiculously vital thing that we thought was always going to be there and somehow is not now. And now we see what happens when it's not there. But we don't describe it in the same way. Even when I'm talking, trying to talk to my family in Chicago, they describe it in different ways. And so that's one of the issues that I think we're going to wrestle with, with national, working with locals. And it may be slightly different per state, that's OK. But we have to find a way to describe what we're talking about and for people to then figure out how do you enter into this space? If you are a donor, can you give $1,000 a year to some of these outlets, right? If you are just want to subscribe, I just want people to, I sub, today, to, even these days at Signal, people come up to me and say, oh, we love Signal, we read this story, and I, my first question to them is, are you a subscriber? They're about to start a member organization. You can subscribe for $20, but the point is support it in some way because that helps build the base for then philanthropy to come in and say, oh, you've got 10,000 subscribers. I'll try to match that, right? We've got to figure out ways for people to understand that the way you support the arts and the way you pay for your Netflix subscription and the way you pay for something else, put news in there too. So I could um, ask you all sorts of questions. I'd love to, but we have a room full of journalists and former journalists and people who love journalism. And so if you want to ask a question about Press Forward, state or national, or you want to make sure that Dale and Dan hear something that they need to hear from you, uh, this is your, your time. Raise your hand. And I'm going to start calling on people. You know that I'll do that. OK, we're going to start with Tommy right here. Make sure you say a word about what you do also for the room. Thanks, Richard. Uh, Tommy Gardner. I'm the uh, news editor for the, the Vermont Community Newspaper Group, right? Uh, Stone Reporter, News and Citizen, Shelburne News, OP, other paper, and uh, The Citizen of Charlotte. It's a big list. Um, you know, we're all community newspapers, and uh, we were talking about it in the newsroom a couple times this year about how at the local level, particularly uh, with community papers, that a lot of our readers and our consumers and the folks in our communities see us as, uh, as basically a utility. They have already a sort of ownership over us as if they feel like that, that they, they can direct the, the, the news storytelling in the, in the community. And in, in a way, that's flattering, and in a way, that's, it, it kind of feels like we're doing our job. But at the same time, I think that when they think that, uh, when you're viewed as a utility, uh, in a way, and, and, and not as, a, as an actual business, which we are, we're 100% for profit, uh, you know, and then looking for ways to uh, maybe expand that, uh, you know, that, that, that kind of, box that we're in, but when it comes to these kind of things like foundations or, or public support, like how, any idea on, or any suggestions on how you can maintain that level of independence that you can get as a, as a uh, for-profit organization and avoid going down that level where people even more think that you are just a public utility. 
Uh, there's definitely a, a lot of conversation um, amongst every outlet that I talk to um, around this issue of independence. Um, as we start nonprofits and have boards, I'm on the board of Signal and I was trained like in my first week um, that people were gonna come to me and ask me to, for the Signal to do a story on X. It happened within like two months. <laughs> I kept saying, no, they're not gonna do that. And someone I knew well, and I respect, just had a question and said, well, you're on the board. Um, can you get them to do X? I said, no. Um, so there is some education that's got to happen, a re-education in this space, because I think one thing that I, this is me as a non-journalist, journalists understand the whole independence and interdependence, that whole ethical part of your work. Many other people don't. And so I tell people, when you go talk to a donor or a foundation person, or if you're gonna have a person be on the board of your nonprofit or an advisory board if you have a for-profit, don't assume they understand the intricacies of the journalism space. They don't remember that it's in the Constitution. They don't remember some of the rules that have been established and norms in your business over the last hundred and something years. And things have, like the guy said earlier, like the senator said, so many norms have been shattered. You kind of got to re-educate um, people around that. I do think people, when they understand it, get it, and most will adhere to it. Some will never adhere to it. Um, but I tell people, philanthropy and donors don't understand the business of journalism. They didn't have to. You guys operated with incredible margins, you did your own thing, you were way up there. Now, you are going to them and asking them for support, money, ideas. Don't assume they understand what you do. They just see the story, not anything behind it. You've gotta help them understand. And we're trying to do that and press forward with our funders. And so journalism doesn't understand philanthropy, and philanthropy doesn't understand journalism. That's a problem when we all need each other now. So I just tell people, don't assume. See where, what, what level they're at and figure out how to bring them up from that level. Does that make sense? And Dale, there are lots of people in this room that do a really good job of communicating with their audiences, their members, their subscribers. Uh, later, you're gonna hear from Paula from Seven Days, the publisher, who does a publisher's note that explains why did we make these decisions journalistically and uses it also as a way of engaging with potential donors. But Richard, do we have another question out there? Anyone else have any questions or comments yes. for Dale and Dan? Yes, so speaking of somebody who does a lot of reporting, I have never seen so many bylines. <laughs> Isabel, and introduce yourself. Okay. Hi, my name's Isabel. I report for the White River Valley Herald, um, but I'm from New Hampshire, which is important because of my question. Um, I, my most recent position was my, the managing editor at my school newspaper, the New Hampshire, and I've lived in New Hampshire my whole life. And when I came to Vermont and started reporting in Vermont, it's like I'm a veteran. People thank me for my service. Like <laughs> People I'm not even interviewing want to talk about doing news. Um, and, you know, New Hampshire is such a close neighbor, but I find the cultural difference really significant. And so I'm wondering if maybe New Hampshire is just not a great place to do journalism or if this is something specific to Vermont that you've noticed and how can you take advantage of that cultural difference if it does exist. Well, I'm never gonna not take the bait to beat up on New Hampshire. <laughs> <clears throat> um, <laughs> uh, who, are there any reporters in the room? <laughs> um, <clears throat> kidding, I have a wonderful working relationship with Dick Ober, who's head of the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation, so please don't pass along my, my comments. But uh, no, I, I think, you know, one of the things we have going for us as a state um, and as a set of communities, you know, I was joking with Dale, what's love, incredible about Vermont earlier, you know, she had the Secretary of State, the U.S., uh, you know, uh, junior U.S. Senator and uh, the, one of the senior members on the State Appropriations Committee in the Senate at the next table over and the table wasn't even full. Uh, <clears throat> um, that is not the kind of thing uh, that happens in other places. 
Um, it's, I would say, and I would hazard the guess that it's pretty unique to have the number of uh, journalism leaders, uh, publishers, business owners, reporters in the same room at the same time talking about shared challenges. I, I'm, I'm willing to bet that that doesn't happen in a lot of other places. Um, so the next step to me, um, and so that, that's a remarkable thing, and I'm, I'm frankly not surprised that people recognize you as a journalist and say thank you for your service. Um, because people take pride in the visibility into what's going on in their communities, um, and I, I would also be willing to guess that that is not a, uh, necessarily a common experience. I imagine Mike, no, when was the last time somebody thanked Mike Donahue, right? Where is he? <laughs> Yeah. Good to see you. At the same token, and this this actually gets to a, a reflection on the earlier question. Um, I think there is a role for community philanthropy in holding the piece of this work that is sacred uh, in its own space, which is to say that the point is the cultivation of shared experience and reflection that builds connection and community. And if you're too reliant, this is why you want revenue diversity, and this is getting ahead of the, uh, what, what needs to be a collaborative process around what a sustainable media infrastructure looks like. But you need revenue diversity, because if you're wholly reliant on uh, local subscribers or local purchasers, you're going to take a lot, I mean, just ask your select board, you're going to take a lot of calls over you know, what's in there. If you're wholly reliant on philanthropy, private or community foundation, you're going to also, you. you uh, you're going to also be relying on a set of viewpoints, whether we like to admit it or not. Um, so we need to think about the revenue that's coming in to support these businesses, you know, support your businesses and your nonprofits in a comprehensive way so you don't end up unduly focused and relying on a particular set of viewpoints. Um, so Dan, um, I think we're going to take another question, but I, what I summarize that as uh, if we have diverse funding, that gets to your question about independence. The more diverse our funding sources, the more independent our journalism can be. Let's take another question from the uh, audience. We have like a whole bunch. And speaking of one of the hardest working journalists in business, <laughs> I know it's a lot of work, but the Waterbury Roundabout is a remarkable Remarkable piece of work that Lisa founded. Here, take it away yes. and say your name. Yes. Good morning. Um, I'm Lisa Scalotti, and I um, was with Community News Service up until the time of the pandemic when we spun off a new nonprofit online news site in our town in Waterbury to replace our, our print paper. You know, we understand there was part of the, the Vermont Community News Group that they had to basically close one of their papers at the start of the pandemic because of how everything went off a cliff. And it was a really bad time to lose our local paper. So we started a website, and it's four years now that we are still at it. But our income right now doesn't um, amount to one salary yet. Um, and we're using it to pay all of our overhead, our correspondence, our, edit, our web editor, who is a UVM grad and still working with me. Um, so anyhow, um, I'm very familiar and been following the Press Forward whole project and endeavor. Um, I know that there are some of us in this room that have submitted applicant applications to the recent uh, Press Forward call for applications and we're on the webinar and all that. Um, and seeing the local chapter starting to bubble up in Vermont is really exciting to see that. And I think I want to ask the question that's sort of like the, the elephant in the room, and that is, um, it's one thing for me to think, oh, I'll, I'll take a grant from Press Forward, this big national organization with this great mission, and I'll be proud to tell my community that. But now I'm thinking, okay, so what about that application to the Vermont Community Foundation slash Press Forward chapter? Um, what's that gonna look like? And where, where will the money from, for that and those, those grants come from? Where will the transparency, as what Secretary Hansis was saying earlier, where will that transparency come from? Because now, now we're looking at money that is going to be pooled into this grant source um, that may be coming from places that we cover, from companies that we cover, from individuals that we cover. And so how do we let our, our readers know where our funding is coming from? Um, and how will that work? Will press the press forward? How are they working in other places, I guess, where they've already started to sort of let people know like what's, what's going into that stew um, that we're gonna be applying to? So Lisa, I hear two things. One's about transparency, mm -hmm. and the other one is about 
how how a local organization can ask for this money, especially when there's national pots and state pots and all that. Is that about right? Yeah, it's, it's a lot to keep up with. There's so many different organizations out there trying to kind of tackle this question, and it's, you know, it's one person trying to do 100 things on any given day. It's a lot to try to follow. Um, but, you know, I feel like there's, there's opportunities out there, so how do we best kind of find the good fits for what we're doing? Who wants to take her question first? First and uh, foremost, I, uh, our intention is to design a, a collaborative process that will inform how we prioritize strategies in this space. But it's a long-term goal relating to the sustainability of the system, the media system and infrastructure across the state, and in, with a particular view into emerging media deserts, like right, where they're where they're, uh, where we're losing outlets or we're at risk of losing outlets. Um, and so uh, I, I'm going to put the burden on Holly Morehouse, who's my VP of Community Impact, who's going to quarterback that. Holly, can you raise your hand if you're in the... There, uh, there you go. Um, you know, uh, please, um, for the sake of that program design, please make sure Holly has your information so we can go through the process. Because like I said, we're generalists, right? Um, this is not an industry, I mean, uh, despite our affinity, this is not an industry or a set of challenges that we have immediate visibility into. So our intention and uh, expectation for ourselves is to design a program and an approach um, that uh, is reflective of what we've heard and what we hear from you all. Um, second question is concerns about what I heard is, well, and within that there'll be transparency about how to apply, how to partner, and how to participate. Within that is what I heard a concern about where money might come from that is funding journalism. Is that n not if I got that right? Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put aside uh, one of the values I think we bring as a community foundation, the ability to do this together, uh, is to create a level of independence between the orig originating funder and the outlet that may be funded or the strategy that may be funded. That said, one of the challenges we will run into in philanthropy is that there, you know, there tend to be two, uh, two layers of philanthropic um, Funder in Vermont. One is looking on a statewide basis at the system, systems level, and one is hyper local. So, our ability to raise money into these resources, into this fund, will pre be predicated at some level on our ability to navigate people's interest in their specific outlet and community uh, while recognizing that that outlet exists in, in an, uh, an industry and an ecosystem that is deeply fragile at the same time. Um, that's going to require a level of education, as Dale, Dale said. But I think there, there is a very real and important intermediary role for a community foundation to play relative to the risk of prejudice or you know, bias or independence on the part of an outlet in this space. I'll just add, um, in terms of how the money kind of gets layered, um, National is giving to every chapter somewhere between over two years, $100,000 to $250,000, as we call them, catalyst funds. Um, every chapter will be eligible to get that. They will eventually get it. It doesn't take much to get it. Just form the chapter and have more than one foundation and more than one outlet that you're talking to, right? It can't just be one foundation deciding to do this on their own. Um, and that really is to seed the chapter and to get them going and to get them working together. Because sometimes they're not used to working with each other, right? Um, and a lot of those dollars so far, um, the chapters are using to do research. It turns out we have our own biases about who we think is in the ecosystem. And I had this when we started Signal, and after we had started Signal, like a year later, I learned about three other hyper-local entities that were in Cleveland that I didn't pay attention to, and I wish I had had. So first of all, don't assume you know your ecosystem, right? And as a group, one way of you know, getting people to collaborate together is to do something together. So do that research together, right? Come with who you think you know as a start. Some people are using it immediately because they see an immediate need to give it out to some of their local outlets because there's just an immediate need to do that. Chicago is an example because they're a little bit further along. They raise, they're a big city, so they raise like amongst their local funders. So they have a local chapter. MacArthur happens to be a part of it. So they raised something like seven or $10 million and they did it. They did their own local pooled fund 
They did their own you know, criteria for applying. They just announced, I think, 15 or 20 grantees. And what, one thing I want people to understand is this is new. We don't know all the different things. Philanthropy does not know all of your outlets. How do we make that happen? We make that happen through these tables, through these open calls and RFPs. We have ways for outlets to describe themselves on Just Fund, and we're going to share that out with funders. But they didn't have to know you. There are very few journalism program officers in philanthropy. I just want you to know. There's not that many. I went to the group. There's like 20 foundations that have been doing journalism for like 20 years. We're trying to expand the pie. But that means there's going to be some education for the new people coming on board. Um, so what Chicago learned from their RFP, they got, I think, about 180-something applications. Half, more than half, of the applications came from youth media organizations. They didn't even know they had that many. So now they're going to do a second RFP, I've been told, on the youth side, right? We're going to learn that from our current open call. We're going to mine the data. We got a lot of applications. We're really excited, actually, to get to know everybody who applied so that we can share that out per state, per whatever you, your catchment area is for your funder. So you can say, don't tell me there's nothing in your region. There is. You just need to get to know who they are. And you need to, we, we can help you figure out what questions to ask and things like that. But just understand, we're all on this kind of learning journey together. The ecosystem, the two groups don't know each other. That's my learning in my first 100 days. So anything we can do to help them know each other, but just know that, and you guys know this, when you're starting something new, it doesn't always go as fast as you would like it to. But it has to start somewhere, and that's what we're doing. So I will just say one thing on the transparency side. At Press Forward National, we're trying to be ridiculously transparent about who's in, where they're giving, and things like that. That's an MOU that our funders sign that they've got to share with us their grants so that we can, we may, we may not attribute it to a specific foundation, but we can, so everybody can know who you're, where you're giving. We're encouraging that amongst the locals as well, is to be as transparent as, poss as possible about where the money is coming from, and just share that out with people. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. And you deal with it as you deal with it, right? But we, we got to stick to a few values, too. And some of those values are journalism values, and that includes transparency, right? Thank you both. We have a question from the audience. Uh, Stamp and introduce yourself, please. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, I'm uh, Josh Ellerbrack, a uh, reporter with the St. Norman's Messenger. Uh, first off, I'm from Ohio, so I, I love to see all the Ohio representation here. <laughs> so. Um, my question is, um, earlier there was a point made talking about some of the language used uh, to talk to donors and basically people are having different understandings and different value points for journalism and how to address those. And I'm curious just in terms of, um, you know, we have a lot of these conversations in the newsroom about what kind of language to use to essentially sell ourselves as journalists to try to, like, to communicate to people what we do and, and why we're important. And um, I'm just curious about what, what kind of um, approach have you seen success with in terms of um, language used? Um, and is it, uh, I mean, does it lean a certain way? Is it more of this business speak of like salesmen or is it more of some of this more civic nonprofit engagement stuff? So I'm just curious about what you're kind of, what, what has been working? Yeah, I, I will just say, who, um, we're trying to come up with some within Press Forward and then share that out on our website with our partners, with our chapters. Common um, themes we're finding, languages, um, messaging that we think works. So stay tuned, one, because we're, we're still in the middle, we're in the early stages of this. But some of the things that are just slowly starting to come out is you really do, depending on who you're talking to, and, and th that includes just your residents, your community people, even they, Somebody really only cares about the work you do to track your elected official. Some people only care about the work you're doing in the arts. Some people only care about the work you're doing in housing. Um, you, unfortunately, I'm sorry, it's a little bit of work, kind of got to figure out what vantage point they're coming from. Because the way you describe your work may differ depending on who you're talking to. And I know we didn't have to do that in the past because the money just flowed. But it doesn't flow right now. And so you've got to customize, kind of 
your language, depending on who you're talking. Now, there's some things that are the same. We can talk about democracy and some of that stuff. But I have some funders who aren't in this press forward because of the democracy issue. They're in it because they're an education funder or they're a health funder, and they understand that storytelling and narrative change, especially coming out of COVID, was ridiculously important, right? We have whole news outlets that started only because of COVID and the languages, they didn't have proper information about what was happening. And then they realized, wait a minute, these people have never had news in their language. We should do something about that, right? So I'm just saying, you gotta do a little bit of work to figure out their, their thought process and why they're in it. But you can, if you're covering all of these things, I'm sure there's something that will appeal to them. But don't assume one thing will appeal to everybody, because it just doesn't. Brendan, Vermont Public. Uh, good morning. Yeah, I'm Brendan Kinney, the interim CEO of Vermont Public. And uh, this question is probably putting the cart before the horse, but one of our core strategies at Vermont Public is collaborations and partnerships. And we have great collaborations with a lot of folks in this room, including Seven Days and Digger, and VCF has been a partner in many of our projects. One of the things that we always think about is regional news and the fact that news you know, transcends boundaries, geographic boundaries. And so one of the questions I have is, is there any thinking yet about the fact that um, these local chapters could really band together to help solve some of the regional news and information challenges that we face. Yeah, it is the cart before the horse, but th there's already been some, I will just say, you know, you, you create an initiative and you think it's gonna be structured in one way, and then it's, it's, it's like, I say, like you have children, and then when you have the children, they're all different. So we have chapters, and it turns out they're all different, and we only have 25. So we have a chapter that we, I'll be honest, we weren't originally gonna approve because we were like, we couldn't conceive of it. It's Central Appalachia, it's five parts of five states plus the whole of West Virginia. They approached us and some of the funders were like, well, we thought we were just gonna do statewide, right, or county, we don't, we don't know what that looks like. So I went, spent two days in Charleston, West Virginia, lovely town, great jazz. They were finishing each other's sentences, the funders because they've been on their own for a long time. They've been working together for decades. I was like, they're gonna be a stronger chapter than some of our statewide chapters who are just starting to get to know each other, right? So the answer is yes. What I've started to say is national does not go in and tell local what to do. Local needs to figure out and define who you are and if locals wanna get together, I've already heard, we've got Vermont, I've talked to New Hampshire, Someone called me the other day from Boston, should there be a New England one, right? Or some way for them to talk to each other, right? We are open to all of that. It's however, I've got communities who are right across the river from each other and don't see each other as the same community and want to do two different things. If that's what you wanna do, you know, uh, we are open is what I will say. <clears throat> As, as one of the 25 children, um, you know, I think that's the kind of in, insight and input we would want to cultivate through a collaborative exercise. But what I will tell you, and I don't think it'll come as a surprise to my team when I say this, is that our concern and focus right now is most immediately in the conditions of Vermont communities. Um, and a, uh, so that, you know, out of the gate, um, will be how we prioritize our energy in terms of the vitality of those local newsrooms and the ability to position them on a vital basis. Uh, I actually, you know, there is this narrative that everybody thinks Vermont it can be a laboratory for things that can go bigger, and I don't uh, mean this. I, 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 I'm frankly getting a little tired of it. Like, we're, you know, I, we don't need to be community lab rats. We actually need our local... Uh, communities to be stronger and if you when you get on the road in this state the conditions economically civically and socially the feedback we get from grantees are increasingly de I mean steadily declining discourse feedback we get from grantees are people retreating into their corners economic frustration um, <clears throat> You know, we've got a lot of work to do. And like I said, I'm an optimist because I know we can work together to do it. But the temptation will be for a lot of organizations and businesses in this room to try to go out and figure out how to solve this or come to the community foundation as one entity. 
we're going to be really looking for how we can do this together uh, as we build. And I, that may be a challenging thing to hear, but I don't, I mean, some of you will succeed doing it on your own, but there are a lot of communities that are going to be left out and left behind if we do it that way. So uh, I just want to add to, I know, Dan, this is one of your uh, major issues, is that Vermont is great, but it's not necessarily as exceptional as some of us say it is. And, you know, we have, for example, at the national level, a lot of great recognition for things that are going on journalistically here in Vermont. You know, VT Digger, for example, is well known. Seven Days is doing. I'd like to pat myself on the back for Vermont Public and what we do. And a lot of the local newspapers and other outlets are known nationally for doing innovative things. And yet, the study that the Center for, for Community News did showed a 75% decline in the number of employees at newspapers in Vermont since the year 2000, 75% decline, and about 60 plus percent decline in the people at radio stations, by the way. And that includes um, the online and the print publications. So maybe we're not quite so exceptional. We still have these problems. Are there any other questions from the audience? Uh, yes, you introduce yourself, please. Um, David Goodman, I host the Vermont Conversation, which is a podcast of Vermont Digger and also airs on WDEV radio. Um, well, first, I want to thank uh, Dan and the Community Foundation for being an early adopter here and for the work that Dale is part of. I don't think there is a sense in the larger community here in Vermont of the crisis and the scale of the crisis. Um, we know that around the country, uh, two local news outlets fail every week. And those are places where I think of it as the lights are going out. It's also happening in Vermont. And as is always the case in vulnerable, less resourced communities first, the lights go out and then it moves. But um, to, just to pick up on your point, Scott, um, yes, we have this exceptionalism. We we're hailed for some of the innovations. What I heard from Anna's talk this morning is uh, that places are, around the country are innovating, looking at ways of getting public resources, of subsidizing this as essentially an, an you know, a, a public necessity, and we are not. You know, this train is moving and Vermont is not on that train of finding innovative ways of harnessing public resources for, as one entity. Now we're talking about philanthropic resources. So I am really struck in some of the things I'm hearing by things we're not doing here. Um, we do a lot of good things, but there are other states are way ahead of us. So I, I, I guess the um, you know, the Community Foundation has great expertise at harnessing resources in a crisis, and certainly they've, done, they've demonstrated that in the flood. I think this is a crisis here in Vermont. I know around this room, there are a lot of people who will go back to their day job of panicking at how under-resourced, uh, understaffed they are to do the work that they do. So I guess my question is for Dale and Dan, um, how quickly we can start moving resources before places and people in this room just run out of gas uh, for doing the essential work that is needed here, and how uh, also the need for a, some entity, when we hear about New York and Washington harnessing public resources, that requires some convening entity to go to the legislature. Uh, the folks in this room are so busy just keeping the lights on in the newsroom, but perhaps that can be part of it. Um, and you're yeah, nodding your head, Scott. So <laughs> I'm nodding very vigorously because I so agree and think we should answer the question, which is let's do this last one first. What role could Press Forward and Press Forward Vermont play in, in the policy? What's the, what's the role of the organization for that? Well, I'll, I'll just start with where we're starting. Um, Press Forward operates because we've got different types of foundations like with colleges, you have aff affiliations with the library, affiliations with you know your your school I mean your your year. We have affiliations within foundations, and so we've start we have working groups. So we have a public policy working group. We really just met for the first time this week. We have 15 foundations all around the country, including a lot of locals, by the way, who all want to. Don't assume most foundations are comfortable with policy. They're not. They have to be taught too, because. 
lots of rules in there, and you don't want us to overstep those rules. But what we believe is of our four infrastructure, of our four pillars, policy is the one we should go the fastest on and the one we should go the biggest on because it's the biggest ROI. And we need to do it like yesterday. So we're coming, we're literally, I was just sending emails last night at midnight. Do we have, is there some rapid response fund so that we could give more money to rebuild local news tomorrow so they could do more of what they're doing? But it's not just rebuild local news. They literally have what, six staff people? Five. There are so many statewide entities that do policy. We could train them up to add journalism as part of that, right? We could train up the locals to add on a person to help do policy. There's lots of strategies to do it, but we've just never done it as a group of foundations together. So just know that that is a place that I'm a policy person, um, that I wanna go fast and deep on because I think that's the best ROI. Dan, what, what sort of role do you think the Vermont Community Foundation could play in policy? And what sort of role do you not necessarily want to play? Um, <laughs> policy is a, is a delicate framework. And where I've seen community foundations grow into policy objectives, it's after a long duration of grant making and understanding the systems in which they're operating, and then realizing that a policy lever is the only thing left to pull. So there's an evolutionary uh, uh, pace that goes from that. Um, so that's not to say that, that we shouldn't create stronger and more committed expectations on the part of policymakers. The single biggest ambiguity I see in this policy space right now is the somewhat arbitrary distinction between for-profit and not-for-profit. Uh, and that has implications for how we approach grant making and the structures that are um, required for us to navigate putting resources to work. So that's one policy question. The other policy expectation that can be set by a state level, and I'm sorry Perchlick's not here, is the expectation that institutions work more closely together. Is there anybody here from Vermont State University Linden's journalism program? Amy, are you here? Johnson? Uh, you know, we do have an undergraduate journalism program in this state that isn't in the room. You know, the expectation that our public institutions of higher education work more closely together to meet the needs of the industry would be a fair one to set when we're putting 100 plus million dollars of our general fund dollars into public higher education. That is not uh, necessarily a valuable thing. Now, <clears throat> if Andy were here, I mean, um, I don't want to channel what Andy might say as on the Appropriations Committee. That definitely wouldn't be fair. Um, what I'm concerned about uh, is the ability of our policymakers to navigate uh, something this complex and this um, ethically ambiguous as public funding for journalism uh, in an environment that is already as fraught as we're in right now. For, we're not blessed with a lot of institutions that can think more than a year or two years out, two year election cycles, you know, one year budget cycle. Um, and I think, uh, so I have some apprehension about either philanthropy or journalism stepping up and advocating for public dollars to go into something when we're seeing school budgets go down, when we're seeing crisis of mental and behavioral health, when we're seeing a housing shortage. We've got a lot of things to solve for. The vitality of our journalism and local newsrooms is a component of that. Um, but when I say that a community foundation is by definition a generalist, uh, if I go to the appropriations committee and say, this is our priority, the food bank's going to be there, Spectrum's going to be there, there's a whole universe of social infrastructure that has already been subcontracted to the nonprofit sector that's incredibly fragile right now. So we are, as a state, old, small, and poor. Uh, so I'm probably using too much time. My hope is that we can align enough philanthropy um, that we can be a bit of a catalyst to get to the point where there's a strong policy case to be made in the competing and challenging relative issues that our legislature has to deal with in an environment of incredibly scarce and getting scarcer resources. Hopefully that is also by being a net importer of capital into the space from the philanthropic strategies that are occurring nationally in terms of putting uh, money back into rural communities and rural outlets. Let me just add that there's starting to be a conversation that, you know, when you look at other sectors that have figured out a, a way in in the policy space, 
that they didn't have. 20 years ago, we didn't have childcare policy. It didn't exist. We had to convince legislators that it was important. Um, five years ago, we didn't have bipartisan criminal justice reform. You had to convince a bunch of different types of actors that it was important to all of them. Journalism has got to do the same thing. We've got to show that in the arts and in housing and in ever, all the other stuff that they want to do is great. We want that. And if people on the ground don't know how that's working or what's wrong with it, all of your work is for naught. So we've got to, we're thinking about how do you expand the pie. Journalism has been really insular. It can't be that way if we're going to do policy work. We've got to think about businesses want people to talk sometimes in, in good ways in the community. It helps them, right? But we have to figure out a way to broaden that table, and that's some of the work that we're going to be doing in the policy space with our locals. I, I, I should actually just, I, was, I think I was unduly um, dramatic probably in that point. What I think we can do and I'm excited to do is better understand the broad landscape of policy interventions that are, is occurring nationally. I'd never heard of the local coupon that DC was doing, you know, whether they're, uh, and, and what is appropriate for the Vermont context um, that we've asked our legislators to operate in. And there may, uh, uh, we need to be willing to the fact that there is a, a learning curve along the evolution of building this system that we're all going to be on and we're going to be on together. So thank you both. Um, I, I just want to sum this up by saying it seems like Press Forward Vermont is an exciting new initiative and a work in progress and that you're seeking the help of everyone in this room today and other people to help you shape and make this thing. We have the uh, email addresses of every registrant here, and so we can pass on information after the conference that includes how you can stay in touch and find out more about Press Forward Vermont as it develops. And I just wanna say a special thank you to Dan and especially to Dale, who made a quick trip. You flew up and you're flying, flying back when? Today. Tonight, um, just to be here and just to say thank you for, for forming this chapter. So thank you both for being here. Thank you, Scott. Um, I just want to say thank you all for coming today. This felt like a really substantive and meaty conversation that we had over the course of several hours. Um, we, I was talking to Roger about how it feels cool that there's a sense of collaboration, even as there is also like a healthy competition among all of the reporters in the room. And let's just like hold on to that. Um, so we have a few. I think there are a few things like action items from this day that we want to follow up on meeting with individuals and also maybe like finding ways to come together or together and they are like passable, possible policy pathways, right? Um, the panel discussion laid out a few menu options for how to do that to help support local news. Um, and then also supporting um, the Vermont Community Foundation as they stand up the Press Forward Initiative and you all will hear more about opportunities there. So you'll hear more from us. Thank you for your really, really thoughtful insights today. Um, we think there are great opportunities hidden in this disruptive moment for news and media and we're gonna figure it out. Richard? Um, the only thing I'll add is, yes, thank you guys for coming. It's so great to see all of you in person. We clearly, the university has a role to play in all of this. And so keep thinking about how we can bring our resources, you know, things like this uh, facilities. We actually had some of our hardworking CNS students maybe taking some notes out of what we've heard today. So some kind of report possibly. Other follow-up that Meg mentioned. Um, a couple of the things we're thinking about a little bit, like how CNS, the Community News Service, continues to support you folks. Summer is a good time to think about that a little bit. If uh, I have conversations with Justin and some of our students, um, there's, a net, there's a program that a couple of other universities are doing called Digital Ambassadors, where they provide student labor to support a media platform who's trying one new technology. And that's something that we're gonna test a little bit this summer with Tim and a couple of others, and that might be something that allows us to tap some of the other sides of UVM, 
the strategic communication side and the marketing side. And then, you know, at UVM also is a whole robust computer science, data visualization. So if there's ways that we can bring that into this conversation, that's something that we're thinking about too. Um, but, be, you know, and we heard, I just got a few minutes with Dale as she was leaving and just loves the <laughs> obvious energy and collaborative spirit here. So I think that Hopefully, we're positioned to get more philanthropy, more work to support you guys, but keep giving us ideas, us being the UVM, me, now Meg and I, UVM, uh, what things that we can do to support you. Um, anyway, so much fun to see you all. I hope you guys get a chance to get outside. Um, it's summer. It's Vermont. <laughs> uh, that's all, I think. So. Be safe, be well, come back, come visit.